My wife and I had dinner with some friends on Thursday night, and we were talking about how things aren't always as they seem. And one of the men told the story of a, of a homeless man who had died in a rural area, and uh, at his death, the funeral director uh, had to conduct uh, the, the services, and, and so he called a pastor in one of the, that rural area and just said, uh, listen, no one's going to be here. He doesn't have a family, didn't, didn't have a home, but everybody deserves a funeral. He said, would you be willing to come and, and just read some scripture and pray uh, as this man is, is uh, being placed in the ground, his body is being placed in the ground? The pastor said, sure, and got the address to try to find the cemetery. And the day came for the burial, and the pastor went out and apparently had the wrong address or wrote it down uh, incorrectly, and he was having a hard time, and he was a male and so didn't want to stop and ask for directions. <clears throat> and did see in a field there, um, there was the men just finishing off. Uh, they had just lowered uh, the lid on the vault, and so he parked his car, hurried over there, and the three men there were by the, the hole in the ground, and he said to them, would you mind if I just took a moment to read some scripture and pray? And so they, they agreed, they, they stood at it and were very uh, uh, respectful. As he read the scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, and then he prayed. He thanked them, and as he's walking to his car, he heard the men talking to each other. They said, that was really, really nice. That was so special. And one man said, you know, I've never seen anything like this in my entire life. In my 25 years of installing septic tanks, I've never. <laughs> Things aren't always as they seem. And I can imagine that Sunday morning and the days preceding it a long time ago. These men had dropped their fishing nets, they left their boats to follow this one who uh, was so different, claimed to be God, claimed to be the Messiah, and, um, and they'd watched him help people. They, they listened to him teach, and nobody taught like this before of any of the rabbis they'd ever seen. And uh, they followed him. I mean, they burned their bridges to follow this man. And then he died. And now what? All of our dreams were attached to his vision, and he's gone. Do we go back to re-engage in our industry, our vocation? Do we go back fishing? What do we do? Things aren't always as they seem, for there was another narrative going on that was written before time began in heaven where God had it planned that Jesus would come forth from the grave. And he, as he did, the words that ring out from the angels that morning who met the women at the tomb, and then Jesus as he met the disciples, were those words, don't be afraid. And that's been our theme this whole month long on Sunday mornings, as we've looked at a passage in uh, the book of Revelation, where John had seen a vision of the resurrected Christ, and we recognize who it was. The Bible says he fell at his face as though dead. And then these words. He said, uh, the voice came, but he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not, I am the first and the last, the living one. I died, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. The text this morning is just those words. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Behold, I am alive forevermore. Death is a fearful thing. In all the studies and surveys that I've ever read about what do, they, what do people fear, it seems like death is always in the top five. But the fear of death is divided into categories. It's the fear of the dying process. Uh, it's the fear of the unknown. It's the fear of losing existence. It's the fear of standing before a holy God. And it's the fear of our loved ones being left behind and the unknown that relates to that. And I want to, I want to say this morning, folks, that because of the resurrection, all those fears can go away. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, all those fears can go away. 
Let me take you to that account, and I'm going to be reading from the Matthew account of the resurrection of Jesus, Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, and an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. For for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. For I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. He's not here, for he is risen as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. Um, so they departed quickly from the tomb were fear and, with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. And there they will see him. I want to share with you this morning just three simple reasons why we don't need to be afraid. All of them related to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The first one is we don't need to be afraid because the resurrection demonstrates that the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross was satisfied. It satisfied the justice of God. And I need to take you back just for a moment to see why all these things happen. The Bible says that God created man uh, to be perfect and innocent in his image. And that all changed one day with Adam and Eve, our forefathers, who because of their sin, sin entered into the whole world for all had sinned. And so there was a, a chasm that was developed between God and all men. I mean all men. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. And so man had to somehow be reconciled to God, but man couldn't do anything to reconcile himself. And we try. We try to compare our sin to other people's sin, and we can always find people who are uh, more sinful than we, right? Or we could try religion. We could try being the best people we could possibly be, but all of sin and come short of the glory of God. The fact of the matter is we couldn't go to God. So God came to us, and this was his plan before the foundation of the world. The beautiful little words of that simple verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That was the plan. And so when Jesus came to this earth as a baby and then lived and, and died, in his death, God placed upon Jesus your sins and mine. And so what the cross, as we talked about Friday, was a sign and a message of victory a sign of, and a message of love. It was God's love that kept him there. But more than anything, it was a sign and a message of substitution. That when you look at the cross and you see Jesus, you say, he, he took my place. I should be there. I should be there. And he died. How do we know then that the death of Christ satisfied the justice of God? How do we know that? The Bible says in the Old Testament, in Isaiah chapter 53, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes were healed. But later in that passage it says, and it pleased the Lord God to crush his son. To crush his son. What great love. But it goes on to say in that same passage, I will not allow my Holy One, Jesus, to see corruption. He would not stay in the grave. And so this prophecy had to be fulfilled. Jesus had to be the Messiah. And as he came forth from the grave, it's this announcement to the world that, that Jesus conquers death. He's, he, he's conquered sin. But it's also an announcement to the world that God was satisfied. So we don't need to be afraid. Not at all. Many years ago, 
I'd heard the story uh, actually from my predecessor in my previous church, the pastor who passed, pastor there before me, a man named Faye Logan, about a young man in his church earlier on years ago who had um, been dating a girl in his church, but this young man had no time for God. He didn't understand uh, uh, Christianity. In fact, as he was dating this young girl named Dottie, he wanted to disprove Christianity, a young lawyer. And so he, like many skeptics all through the ages, have looked at Christianity as being suspended by some pillars. And if we could destroy one or two of those pillars, Christianity would crumble. And so the pillars that often are looked at are the conversion of the, the Apostle Paul. How did that happen? What's the explanation for such a dramatic change? Or the reliability of Scripture is another pillar. But one of the biggest pillars is the pillar of the resurrection. So he went out to disprove the resurrection, did study, uh, and began to write, keeping careful notes on all that he'd studied. And one day he came to my friend, the pastor, and he says, uh, I'm convinced. I'm convinced that it happened. And this Jesus that came forth from the grave, I need him in my life. And Josh McDowell got on his knees and gave his life to Jesus. And he began to put in book form all of his studies, and he's written a number of books all through the years. And those first ones were uh, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And he wrote a sequel to it, creatively named, More Evidence That Demands a Verdict. But he wrote another book that I've always enjoyed. And it's so simple. In fact, the front cover said over five or 15 million in print. And it's entitled More Than a Carpenter. And it really examines the evidence from Scripture and from history to say, who is this Jesus? Because a lot of people reject what they don't know. And it's incumbent upon us as intelligent people to know what we reject. And so um, we've given away many, many, many of these copies all through the years. And let me encourage you today, if you're on that journey uh, and you're here today to celebrate Easter with family or whatever, um, and you say, I'm not there yet, I just, I need to know more. Uh, please take one of these books. They're available at the front here, this front corner after the service. You don't need to leave your credit card or a deposit. This is our gift to you, okay? You don't even need to leave your name. Just take one of those books. But if you read it, I'd love to know what you think about it. Uh, but pick up one of those books, More Than a Carpenter. And what Josh had found out and what he did that day, <coughs> that day with, the, uh, with the pastor is he very simply prayed to God and committed his life to him. The scripture says so beautifully, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Folks, we don't need to be afraid of death or any part of it because the resurrection of Jesus Christ demonstrated that the wrath of God and the holiness of God were satisfied in the death of his son. The second reason we don't need to be afraid is because the resurrection gives us life. There was a story told in the life of Jesus where he had a friend, um, friends, um, one of them named Lazarus and his two sisters named Mary and Martha. And Lazarus was very sick and Jesus, they had watched him heal people all through his life, his ministry. If somebody was blind, Jesus would heal him. If somebody couldn't walk and maybe their legs never had the strength to support their body. An encounter with Jesus, Jesus would heal him. With leprosy, a disease at that time that had no medical scientific cure. And people would run from lepers for fear that they would be contaminated. Not Jesus. Jesus would change their life and would heal them. So there's story after story of Jesus changing the lives of people physically. So Mary and Martha sent word to Jesus. Our brother is sick. He's going to die unless you come. And so Jesus came four days late. Can you imagine these two sisters believing in Jesus? He was late by their calendar. He was not late by his. He arrived. 
Martha came running out to him, and she said, you can almost feel the angst, maybe a little anger in those words, if you had been here, our brother wouldn't have died. You ever felt like that? All of us go through that when we lose a loved one. That, that, that we go through those stages of, of grief that often involve a shock and blame and guilt. And if you'd only been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And Jesus said, well, your brother will live again. I know he's going to live again in the last day, but what about now? What about us? And how do we keep going? And Jesus said something there that helps us so much. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that believeth in me and lives will never die. And he said to Mary and Martha, do you believe this? They had to answer that question. And so do we, by the way. Every living human being has to answer that question. It was Larry King who was asked, he was interviewed thousands of people over his long, long career in television. And he was asked the question, if you could interview one person from history, who would it be? His answer, Jesus. Well, what question would you ask him? I would ask him this question. Did he really come forth from the grave? And Larry King went on to say that the answer to that question would change everything. The scripture says, yes, he did. He came forth from the grave. Jesus didn't come into this world just to make people who were blind to see, who couldn't walk to walk. He didn't come into this world to make our marriages better or to make us successful in business. He came into this world to reconcile us to an almighty, eternal God and to give us life, not to make our lives better. That will happen not only when we come to know Jesus, does he give us life abundant and, and wonderful and with purpose, and he'll walk with us, but the day will come when we see him and we'll spend eternity with him. I was reading uh, USA Today yesterday, the opinion page, and John Dickerson had written an article. Uh, John is, uh, is an evangelical Christian. In fact, he's going to be our guest uh, at our annual celebration in the middle of May. But he wrote this article, and his, his point was that the names that we see today in the news, um, the, the five that are running yet for, uh, for president, we're bombarded with those names uh, uh, every day. And he said, these names are just names that they'll pass. They're like sand castles that are built but the waves of time and history will wash them away. And he says every one of these names will become part of history. One of them, perhaps, uh, he or she will become President of the United States. And when they do, they'll serve their four years or eight years. And then a library will be built in their name. And it'll be a Wikipedia entry from that point on. <laughs> but he, he makes his point, he illustrates it, by saying Kanye West and uh, Paul McCartney uh, collaborated together to do a song. Now, some of you know Kanye West, and some of you know Paul McCartney, and some of you actually know both names. <laughs> but he makes his point that Paul McCartney, to the young Kanye West fans, is an unknown. And so the tweets that came in uh, after the, the, the collaboration of this song uh, are, are hilarious. One of them from young Kanye West fans. One says, I don't know who Paul McCartney is, but Kanye is going to give this man a career with this new song. <laughs> hmm. um, another one, who blank is Paul McCartney? Question, question, question mark. This is why I love Kanye, for shining light on unknown artists. Who is, who is Paul McCartney? Six question marks. He's about to blow up, thanks to Kanye. So, these names come and go. But there was a name who came not with empty promises. He came in humility, fulfilling the promises of his coming from Isaiah chapter 61, where it says he's going to come and proclaim the captive free. 
He's going to pronounce good news to the poor. He's going to pro proclaim that this is the year of the Lord's favor. And he came in humility, not to be served, but to serve. And when John the Baptist saw him, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he died. But he came forth from the grave three days later. And those disciples who saw it had their lives so dramatically changed because Jesus gives life. And this morning, on every continent on this global circle, 2.2 billion followers of Jesus are pronouncing his name and singing, Hallelujah, Christ the Lord is risen today because he stands out from any other human figure on this earth, no matter how great they proclaim themselves to be. He gives life. We don't need to be afraid ever of death or any part of death because the resurrection proves that the wrath of God was satisfied. We don't need to be afraid because the resurrection gives us life. And we don't need to be afraid because the resurrection empowers us for living. I love the words of the Apostle Paul when he wrote with clarity, he says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings becoming like him in his death. He goes on to write in Ephesians chapter 1, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. And skeptics will write and they'll say, Jesus couldn't come forth from the grave because the Roman soldiers were there to, to guard it. Jesus couldn't have come forth from the grave because there was a, a large stone in front of the, uh, that grave opening with the Roman seal, and that stone itself had to weigh 6,000 pounds. Folks, that's the easy part. Bringing life from death, that's what only God can do. And that power that we've been singing about this morning, the power of the resurrection is available to us through the living Christ. And this is great news to any, any mother who's lost a child. This is great news to parents who are, who are struggling uh, with the death of a child, the death of a husband, the death of a wife. It was one year ago today, uh, Mike Feezy left this earth. We, we all know Mike, he was part of our church, a huge part of our community. Mike's life was changed in his 30s. In his 20s, he had everything. He had everything but peace with God and everything this world could offer. In his 30s, somebody challenged him to read a book and he read it and God used this book and the scripture found in it to draw him to himself. And Mike's life was changed. And from that point on, Mike lived to love and to love people. Taken from us um, too suddenly. A year ago today, I, t I um, texted his um, family this morning and encouraged them today to find the power of the resurrected Christ for this day and for every day. You see, the power of the resurrected Christ helps us through the most difficult of times. I asked a, a week ago in our Sunday services, I said, have, have you ever been placed in a situation where you, you're over your head? Where you've got something that you can't will your way through? Where something that your education and your training can't conquer? It happens all the time. But when it does, it's a reminder to us that we don't have to survive this life in our power, that we have the availability of resurrection power through a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, the resurrected Lord. Lean on that power. I'm going to pull this together. We don't need to be afraid. That is, if we're followers of Jesus. If we're followers of Jesus. Um, if you're a follower of Jesus, take this day and rejoice. If you're not a follower of Jesus, may I encourage you to either pick up the book after the service, 
Or perhaps you're here today and you say, I've fought this long enough. Um, I know that Jesus is the Son of God. I know that He died for me. And I've, I've battled this, this selfish will. And today, I want to submit my will to the will of the Lord. And if that's the case, I would encourage you to do what um, I've asked people to do for probably 30 years of pastoral ministry now. And that is just pray. Just pray. And pray that prayer of salvation from your heart. Where you just said, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve an eternity apart from you. But I turn from my sin. And I trust in Jesus alone for my salvation. What I love to do now is lead in, in a prayer. And I'll in, and include in that prayer a prayer of salvation. And if God is leading you to pray that prayer with me, pray it. But if not, don't. You, you may not be ready yet. But um, if you're ready, pray that prayer with me and experience uh, the, the salvation that can only come through Jesus. Would you pray? Heavenly Father, I thank you today for the resurrected Christ. I thank you, for a Father, for the hope that that gives through the difficulties of life. And Father, the hope that that gives and the fear that's removed when we stand before a holy God one day. And Lord, I pray for those today who may not know you yet. Lord, I pray that you'll lead them to pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, today, I admit that I'm a sinner and I need a savior. And today, Father, I, I give up. I, I turn my life towards you. I turn from my sin and I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Come into my life as Savior and Lord, change me for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.